I give all glory and honor to my Father God who lives in heaven. I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I acknowledge the Holy Spirit who strengthens, guides, protects, and inspires me each and every day. To everyone who can hear my voice, I greet you in peace. Amen. How many of you have ever been to a restaurant? Let me see your hands. You ever been to a restaurant? Okay. Now, normally when you go to a restaurant, the host or the hostesses, hostess seats you, right? And then they tell you, just hold on a minute. Your waiter or waitress will be right with you, right? Sometimes the waiter and the waitress doesn't bring you the menu that you would like to see. They bring you the menu that's based on what time of day it is. Many restaurants have times for breakfast and time for lunch and time for dinner. One, time, one day, I just had this great desire. I didn't feel like cooking, right? And I had a taste for breakfast. And it had to be about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so I went to a diner. And I asked the waiter, I said, are you still serving breakfast? And the waiter said, yes, we are. And I was so happy. And I ordered me a stack of pancakes, some grits, some corned beef hash, and some eggs. I'm not trying to make you hungry. I'm just telling you what I ordered. So I was very happy that I was able to satisfy my desire for breakfast. Christians, I want to ask you a question. Do you know that there's a spiritual restaurant that you can go to on a regular basis and ask to see a menu? Do you know that at this spiritual restaurant, there are different menus that you can place your order from? Do you know that based on how you've been living, sometimes the host will present you with a menu that you have to select from and will not give you any other options? Do you know about this spiritual restaurant and this spiritual host and this spiritual waiter? I'll take your silence and your hmms for you're, you're waiting for me to get to the punchline. You're waiting to discover where, what block or what city or what state this restaurant is in. Well, I could tell you that you can find it in Hebrews chapter 4, starting at verse 14. So if you brought your Bible with you, you now have a GPS to get you there. If you didn't bring your Bible with you, then you might have to go to McDonald's or Wendy's or some other restaurant. But all of us are going to be at this other restaurant that I'm talking about. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter four, verse 14 says. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word. Amen. The subject today is, which menu do you want and place your order? Amen. Amen. Which menu do you want and place your order? First, let me explain the text. The text says we have a high priest who is our representative to God. If you do not know, there is a difference between a priest and a prophet. The prophet is God's representative to man, and the priest is man's representative to God. 
So the text is telling us that Jesus Christ, who came down from heaven to exist on earth and went through the human experience, he is worthy to be human beings representative to God. How many times do you have a, a lawyer and they don't know nothing about you? Or you have someone who's representing you and they have no clue who you are, what you do, and what you think and what you want. I call those people politicians. The times that you see them in church is when they want your vote. Or the time that you see them by your train station or your bus station is when they want your vote. But Jesus Christ is the representative because he went through all of the temptations the trials and the tribulations, the backstabbing and the betrayal that a human being goes through in their life. Amen. So he is a worthy representative of the people to God. Yes. And in service to God, he has your back. Yes. He knows what you want. He knows what's best for you. He knows your trials and he knows your tribulation. So when he is in communion, in relationship to God, you do not have to worry about him leaving anything out. Amen. He's got you covered. He's better than the best insurance policy that you could ever have. Most often you have insurance policy and when you need them, they say, oh, well, that's not covered. I want you to know that Jesus Christ as your high priest, he has you covered. Amen. The text goes on to say that we are to stay faithful through tough times. It says, hold on to your faith. Yes. Too many people, yes. when a trial or a tribulation or someone dies or they find out they have an illness that is not an illness to, that will past, but an illness to death, they want to forget about God. They want to say, yes, I believed in my heart and I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, but if Jesus Christ was my Lord, why is this happening to me? Why would he allow this to happen to me when I confess with my mouth and believed in my heart that Jesus Christ was Lord? Why is he allowing this to happen to me? So they say to themselves, OK, you let this happen to me. I withdraw everything that I said about you. You are not my Lord. Because you allowed this to happen to me. The scripture is telling us to hold on to our faith. I submit to you this day that when you find yourself in the middle of a trial or a tribulation or a temptation or a death, or a becoming jobless, or your home burns down, or anything that could happen to you in this life that you would classify as bad, that is not the time to leave God. That is not the time to recant your faith. That is the time when you grab a little bit firmer onto God's unchanging hand. Matter of fact, some of us, as quiet as it be told, we're hanging by a thread when it comes to God. Some of us don't even have a hold hand on God. We got like fingertips on God. And we're just waiting for the wind to come to blow us away. Well, I want you to know that when trials and tribulations and cloudy and rainy and stormy days come, that's when you hold on to God with both hands. I don't know about you, but if I'm if I think of myself as a little a little child and God is a big God, a full grown adult, when the storms come, that's when you grab a God's leg. Some of us, God is really big. Right. So we can't grab his waist because he's so tall. Some of us just need to grab onto one leg and just hold on. And when God moves, just move with God. But some of us want to say no. I'm going to strike it out on my own. Don't you know that when you strike out on your own, that is a form of rejecting your faith? So the scripture tells us to hold on, hold fast our confession. Now it comes to the restaurant time. But in the scripture, it is manifested as 
a throne of grace. But I submit to you that the throne of grace where you can go get grace and mercy as it's talked about in the scripture is really a spiritual restaurant where the Christian knows to come to when they have a need, a desire, or a want. The Bible says man will not survive by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. That's why your Bible is so important, because you can't survive by leaning to your own understanding or leading to or leaning to what men and women will feed you. How many of you can attest that someone has fed you something and it wasn't necessarily good for you? Or you found out what they fed you was actually a poison to destroy you. God has this spiritual restaurant where when you come, you know how they grade restaurants? You see an A, you see a B, and everything else fails. Actually, to be honest, I wouldn't eat from a restaurant that didn't have an A. Because I want to make sure that it's totally clean. So, the scripture says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain and find grace to help in time of need. Let's hold. We're going to hold because although I could preach through a baby's cry, I need your attention to be on the word and not on the baby's cry. Because these messages are too important for you to be distracted. You have to get God's voice, his message in stereo through both ears, not through just one ear. Because if it goes to one ear, you might find yourself lacking and having missed something. But you need to have your full attention. See, I could preach through anything. But I want you to be Clear to get the message. Amen? Amen. So, it says, Let us come therefore boldly to the throne of grace that you may obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. Christians, I have this question for you. God said that you can come boldly to the throne of grace and mercy to get grace and mercy. Why? Are you only going into the presence of God getting grace and mercy? Just because the scripture told you that's all you could get? And that's why you go to God's throne for grace and mercy? Some Christians only go to the throne of grace to get grace and mercy because they can't get nothing else because their lives are not in alignment with God. And in order to not be rebuked or killed by God immediately or judged by God, you go to the throne of grace and mercy because you know you are not living right. Amen. Matter of fact, you go to the throne of grace and mercy and only ask for grace and in mercy, because you know Psalm 66, 18 says, if I regard the iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. So you go to God for grace and mercy because you got a prayer answer that you want him to hear, but he won't hear it unless you ask for grace and mercy. So Christians only go to God and ask him for grace and mercy. When I go to the throne of grace and mercy... I'm not like the most Christians who are asking God for the menu that just contains grace and mercy. Amen. I've learned something about God, that my God is a big God and his offering is bigger than any banquet feast yeah. that you can imagine. So when I go to God, to the throne of grace and mercy, I'm living in a manner in which I don't require Main course meals of grace and mercy. See, for me, grace and mercy is an appetizer. 
because I've begun to get my life right, because I've begun to have a relationship with God and I've begun to understand how much he loves me and desires me to live in his will. And I've begun to understand that true success and true blessings come from being and following God. So I don't need to go to ask God for a big main course meal of grace and mercy. I begin to say, God, I only need an appetizer of grace and mercy to cover the imperfections in myself that I haven't mastered yet. But God, after you give me that appetizer and I know that I'm now covered. Now I want to see your other menu. I want to see what other things you have in store for me now that I'm before your throne of grace and mercy. And I have studied your word to know that you have more to offer me. I've gone through the scriptures and I see the promises. I've seen the menu that you truly have to offer me. I say, God, give me the menu for what I stand in need of right now. Give me the menu for what I will need tomorrow. Give me the menu that will help me be more obedient in ways that I am not necessarily wanting to be obedient. God gives me the menu. He presents me with different menus. And you know what? Some of them I didn't even ask for. Don't you know that when you get past the need for grace and mercy in large portions, God will reveal to you other blessings that you did not even know that he had to offer you? The things that we think as Christians that we know and see about God, they pale in comparison to the things we don't know about God. So Christians, we need to live in a manner where we can get past healthy, large sized portions of grace and mercy so we could go and understand the deep and wideness of God. So he can pour us out things where we are able to do things that are unbelievable when you think of man. Where's the Christian's incredible strength? Where's the Christian's incredible knowledge and wisdom? Where's the Christian's ability to touch someone and they be healed immediately? You can't touch no one and they be healed immediately because you need too much grace and mercy. You even you haven't even gotten there yet. But is God a liar? Is Jesus Christ is is he a liar? Didn't he say much greater things you would do because he goes to do be with his father? So the question is, why are you not doing them? You're doing them because you're stuck living in the age of grace, which occurred after Jesus Christ hung on the cross. And you need heaping bowls of it thrown on you because of the way that you're living And God is putting out that fire. How could he come and offer you something else when your urgent need is grace and mercy? When will the Christian desire more of God? And you desire more of God when you start living right. Till this day, I still hear Christians talking about each other when they think nobody is listening. Till this day, if I was an old school operator where they had to connect your call (laughs) and I was listening, there's too many phone calls talking about each other and talking about the church. There's too many people who are not even reading their word and relating to each other and loving each other and preferring Christians. The day you prefer someone in the world more than you prefer your brother and sister in Christ, something is wrong. God, you're stopping God from manifesting his will in your life. 
Who in here wants to be stuck on 21? Nobody wants to be stuck on 21. Not even if you're old, you, you want to be stuck on 21 because you realize that when you were 21, there's so many things and so many experiences you don't have. It, com it's, it sounds good to be 21, but you know so less. You don't even know yourself. So if you don't want to be stuck on 21, why are you still stuck on needing grace and mercy? When are you going to desire more of God and show God you desire more of him by living right? Yes. Amen. Some Christians, when they come before the throne of grace and mercy, and they're looking for grace and mercy, God withholds the menu from you. He says, nah, you didn't order it from that menu far too often. You've supposedly repented and if I, I've extended to you grace, you supposedly repented and I extended to you mercy. And now here you are again, boo-hoo crying. And you're asking for the same menu. And guess what? God says, no, I'm not going to give you that menu because God is a father. And with being a father, you do things that may hurt your heart. You do things that may hurt your child, but it is all to build them up. There's no parent who truly loves their child that's going to discipline that child to the extent that is not true love discipline, but it's something else that shouldn't even be on the face of the earth. So you come to God and you look for a menu of grace, and guess what God hands you? He hands you a menu of correction and say, here, take one of these, which pick which one you're going to go through. He hands you a menu of rebuke, rebuking you, saying, here, you're going to take this. He hands you a, mem a menu of a reprobate mind because you have gone so far out. He said, oh, you really want to do that? Then I'll guess what? I'm going to let you do it and I'm going to remove my covering from you. And you need to be careful when God removes his covering from you and gives you over to a reprobate mind. What does reprobate mind means? It says whatever you think is good, you do. Whatever your natural person thinks is good, go ahead and do it. Your conscience? Oh, forget about it. You won't hear for your conscience. I'm going to silence it. Now you're giving over. Now you, you thought you was bad. Now you could really be bad. And the enemy is out there waiting for people like you. There's people out there waiting for people out like you so that they can misuse you and mistreat you. You have to be careful when you come before the throne of grace. How far have you tested God's patience? You come for seeking one thing, but God will give you something else. Why settle for grace and mercy when you can have the full blessing menu? Why settle for just being an average Christian? There's a whole bunch of average Christians. The Bible says people, the Christians scarcely make it in. All of the average Christians, they make it in by the skin of their teeth. Is that the type of God that you serve, that you are going to pay him back for what he did to you by just being average? By just being a meal eater of grace and mercy day after day after day? Or are you going to reward God and show God how much you love him by being a Christian who God is proud of? The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. You know what that means? It means all the Christians are average. They fall short of the glory of God. He is not proud of them because they're not doing anything that's exemplary in their life. I don't know about you, but I've decided not to be an average Christian. When I am tired, I will work when I am tired. When I am sick, I will work when I am sick. 
when my vision is betraying me and I have double vision, even though I'm getting up here to preach and I'm seeing a kaleidoscope on this side, I will work for God because God is able to do abundantly, exceedingly more than I can think or ask. People want to walk around talking about, I want to be blessed. What are you doing to get blessings from God? You're happy with the blessings from God that keeps your heart beating and your, your lungs working and you have a job and you have cover in your household? That's what you want out of this life? That's acceptable? You want to live on the border of being poor and middle class? You want to live on the border of being Middle class and rich? Is the money all that you really need to be happy? Is that the type of Christian you want to be? God is saying to you, I have menus for you. I have a restaurant and my restaurant is not, it doesn't close at 11 o'clock. It is a 24 hour restaurant and it is better than any fast food joint that you can go to to satisfy your immediate need with instant gratification. God has a spiritual restaurant that the Christian can come to and God will give you menus that you can select from. And if you are living right, there's menus in God's treasure chest that he will pull out and offer to you and be proud of you. He will make you a difference maker in this world. He will use you and lift you up where people will be jealous of you because they don't know how you got it when all the Christian has to do is to serve God and serve God with their whole heart. The Bible is, it shows all of the people who just want it to be average. But God is looking for a new thing in this world. The Bible says he created a priestly, holy nation. He didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. But Christians are just using it in an average manner, doing average things, living average lives, and still asking God for above average blessings. When are you going to match the desires of your heart, the types of blessings you truly want, When are you going to align those things and match them with your life? God is waiting on you. He will stand there with his arms crossed waiting on you. What menu do you want? And remember to place your order. I pray this message has been a blessing to you. I pray that it moves you to be an above average person and an above average Christian. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen.